Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, sponsored by ACR Poker, where the $10 million guaranteed Venom is back. That's right. Today is Thursday, July 20th, as this is being recorded in the year 2023. And the Venom is back. It's a $2,650 buy-in only on ACR Poker, where you can get a first-time deposit bonus up to $2,000. 100% of your initial deposit up to two k by using the promo code TPE. My name is Clayton Fletcher, and I'm your host in New York City. That's right. Been a long time since I haven't said fabulous Las Vegas. It's great to be back in the Big Apple. I'm actually going to be performing this weekend at Westside Comedy Club. Anyone who's in New York and wants to see a stand-up comedy show, I may or may not be discussing the last seven weeks in Las Vegas at Westside Comedy Club. Get tickets now at Westside Comedy Club. Dot com. Well, I'm back. Very sad to have put the World Series of Poker 2023 edition in the books. The summer of Clayton <laughs> has come to an end, and that, that's not a good feeling. The day the World Series of Poker ends, I start looking forward to the next one. As many of you know, I am the biggest WSOP fan in the world, even though this year I spent probably just as much time at the win. <laughs> Speaking of the win, they have some competition coming up. Our top story this week is that the World Series of Poker has announced something they are doing for the first time this December in partnership with GG Poker, the WSOP Paradise at the all-too-familiar Atlantis Casino Resort in Paradise Island, Bahamas. So this is obviously their way of competing with the WPT Championship. All of the vociferous accolades, attention, and kudos that the World Poker Tour received last December for their first ever WPT Championship at the win, I guess were just too much for the World Series of Poker to sit idly by and allow to happen again this year. So right at the end, of this WSOP, they announced that in December, on the same dates as the WPT Championship, they'll be doing their own thing, this WSOP Paradise, December 3rd through 14th, competing directly with that WPT Championship. So uh, it looks like these two mega poker companies are competing with each other, trying to get your poker dollars to be spent on their turf. So you tell me on Twitter, at Clayton Comic, are you planning on attending either the WPT Championship at the Wynn Las Vegas or the World Series of Poker Paradise at the Atlantis Casino Resort in Paradise Island, Bahamas this December, or perhaps neither. Or maybe you're going to do EPT Prague. Let me know what your plans are for December. 2023. I don't know which one I'm going to be doing yet, but I'm probably going to be back at the win. I just, I don't know. They really knocked my socks off last year. And, uh, you know, from previous experience traveling back and forth to the Bahamas. Now, the Bahamas is much closer, by the way, to New York City than is fabulous Las Vegas. But, you know, the $38 bottles of uh, Fiji... (laughs) out there in the Bahamas are uh, somewhat of a deterrent for a cost-conscious poker consumer such as your boy. So yeah, let me know what you guys are planning on doing. I'm sure many of you haven't decided yet. This announcement just came out a few days ago. But yeah, I want to know, you know, should we expect them to not hit that 29 million number again at the win in December because so many of the top players will be heading to the Atlantic Ocean instead. 
Well, I want to move on because we have a lot to discuss. The World Series of Poker broke all the records this year. Obviously, poker is booming once more. There are new poker TV shows, lots of new poker personalities and vloggers, and it's all very exciting. Um, I want to give a big congratulations to a player that many of you may not have even heard of, but he's a longtime grinder, mostly an online player. His name is Mike Holtz, and his username on WSOP.com is Brock Lesnar. I don't know who Brock Lesnar is. Maybe I should Google that before I start saying his name on the podcast, but he broke the record for caches in a single WSOP with 25 of which 13 were in the live space. So congrats to Mike Holtz. I've played with him quite a bit in the WSOP.com streets, although I don't think I've ever been at any of his live tables over the many years that the two of us have been out here battling in tournament poker land. Uh, But yeah, this is a very impressive accomplishment. Alan Kessler, of course, had something to say about it. He was a, he seemed a little bitter, maybe jealous, that the record for most caches now belongs to Mike Holtz. And he f- felt the need to come after Mr. Holtz on Twitter uh, for kind of claiming to have the record. You know, uh, Alan Kessler's opinion is this record is bogus because these are, you know, half of these are online bracelets and that's not the same. I guess Alan's point being that it's much easier to cash in an online bracelet event than it is to cash in a live bracelet event. I'm not sure that I can subscribe to that view myself. I don't know. Maybe I'm silly, but I think that the live realm is easier. I don't know. What do you guys think? You know what? You can check it out on the Discord, okay? Tournament Poker Edge, we have our own Discord You can get on there. Tell us what you think. Let's start a discussion about whether or not Alan Kessler has a point by saying that Mike Holtz has nothing to be proud of with his 25 caches, given that half of them were obtained in online bracelet events. Or is Alan Kessler just being his typical petty self? All right, enough about all of that stuff. I don't want to get into gossip and rumors and who said what about whom I want to talk about the WSOP main event. Now, this main event was an all-time record breaker with $12.1 million going to the first place prize winner. I want to talk through a few hands that I played in this tournament, this record-breaking tournament. I have a memento from the tournament. I prefer the term memento to participation trophy. (laughs) But basically everyone who played in this tournament received a very nice, by the way, very nice uh, card protector, kind of World Series of Poker gold chip thing that you can put over your cards. Now I'm never going to use that in play because I don't use card protectors. I use chips for that purpose. And if I'm all in, I just keep my hands on my cards so that an overzealous dealer doesn't snatch them away from me and then have to call the floor and find out what's supposed to happen to my hand that I was all in with. So yeah, that's the point of a card protector. But many players just like to have a little something on the table that can serve as a conversation starter. Umberto Brennis has his little plastic shark. You've seen other players with different like little ducks or whatever. It's fun. You know, I don't I don't disparage anyone for using a card protector. I just don't believe in them myself. However, I am happy to have my participation trophy because it's the only prize I was awarded in this year's main event. So right after the first break, the blinds have gone up to 200, 300 and 300, and I'm already down to 44,000. They start you in this tournament with 60,000. And I've already lost about a quarter of my stack. Um, In one case, I defended my big blind with queen nine suited, which I think every solver would have us doing, especially deep stacked. And I flopped a queen, checked and called, checked and called, checked and called against a player that I perceived to be somewhat loose and aggressive. And he had an overpair 
to the board in the form of pocket aces and got maximum value against me. So that cost me quite a bit. And also there was another hand where I had top pair and it also was no good. So yeah, that was how things got off to kind of a rocky start. Now this comes from level two, the 200, 300, 300 level. And the action folds to me, Clayton Fletcher on the button and I'm holding the queen of clubs, queen of diamonds. The blinds in this hand are both um, what I would consider pretty typical recreational players. They're not bad. You know, nowadays the amateur players, the recreational players, they're not bad at poker. They're just certain moves that they might not have in the arsenal. So just kind of typical, mostly tight, kind of passive and not too scary. So I make it 800 with my pocket queens and the small blind folds, but the big blind, who is by the way from Paris, France, calls and he's got me covered. And the pot is 2100 and the flop comes ace of spades, 10 of clubs, six of hearts. So ace, 10, six, rainbow, hero holding pocket queens and the opponent checks now, I'm always going to bet this flop, whether I have an ace or not. Anytime you flop in position versus just one big blind defender and there's an ace and another Broadway card on board, I think the solver would pretty much always have us betting and betting pretty small. So that's exactly what I do here. I put in 500 into the 2100 pot. And the reason why is because I like to be able to get called by a hand worse than pocket queens. Now, if he's got an ace, I'm probably going to lose a few chips in this pot, but I want him to be able to call me with a hand like 10-9 or possibly a gut shot, maybe something like King Jack, right? So that's what we're looking to get action from, and I bet 500 with that intention and get the call. So now with 3,100 in the pot, we're going to see a turn, and it comes the tray of clubs. So our board is now ace, 10, 6, tray, with backdoor clubs starting to get there and my opponent checks. Well, at this point, I think we have a decidedly medium strength hand and I decide to just go ahead and check it back, right? I mean, we, there's no reason to bet this card. If my opponent has a 10, he's likely to fold it. Maybe not for the fear of having to call this bet, but just the what Harrington calls the hammer of future betting. He has to worry that he won't get to showdown just by calling one more bet, if I bet the turn, he's got to worry that I may also bet the river. And when he has the hands I want him to have, like a Jack-10 or 10-9, because he can't call two more bets, he may decide not to call one. So for that reason, I think we want to check behind on this turn card for pot control and similar purposes. And now that's exactly what we do. So there's still 3,100 in the middle and the river comes the king of hearts for a final board of ace, 10, six, tray, king. And now our opponent leads out for 2,000 tournament units. So pretty sizable bet here, two thirds of the pot. I think that folding is totally fine. He could well have an ace, although if he does, he's unlikely to have ace, king, or ace, 10, both of which probably would have three bet pre-flop, or at least they should, versus my opening range from the button. Um, but yeah, he could have some other kind of two-pair hand, maybe something like King-10 or whatever. But otherwise, he may just have a weak ace or possibly just a king. So if he's got a hand like King-Queen or King-Jack, yeah, King-Jack we don't block, and that's a gut shot on the flop, makes a pair on the river, and maybe trying to go for thin value versus a hand like the one I have, pocket queens. So it's not a bad play by him if that's what he's up to. But what he doesn't probably foresee is that I decide to put in a raise here. I make it 8,500. And the reason why is I think I have a nuts advantage. Right? I should have aces in my range, three of them. Kings, three of them. Tens, three of them. All in my range for you know having played this way a little bet on the flop, then check the turn, and then maybe planning to bomb on the river 
it's a pretty profitable strategy to employ. Yeah, also, and very importantly, I block the nuts. So I think I have a nuts advantage, and I also block the actual nuts, which in this hand would be queen jack. I have two of the queens, making it very unlikely that my opponent actually has queen jack specifically. And I can, of course, represent it the way I've played this hand anyway. So I make it 8,500, and my opponent goes deep into the tank, and he thinks about it for about two or three minutes. Now, when this was happening, I started remembering the conversation I had two weeks ago with Alex Fitzgerald and Craig Tapscott, and we were talking about what the job of the tournament professional is. Your job is to put your opponent into difficult situations. Give him a headache. And, you know, this guy, he's sitting there, he starts speaking French to himself. He's really struggling to figure out what to do when I raise on the river. And at that point, I put him squarely on a medium strength hand, maybe something like ace eight, just one pair with not much of a kicker, possibly king jack, something like that. And just because I have the nuts advantage, I decided to polarize myself and go for a big raise here. So I made it 8,500. It's not that big a raise, by the way. It gives me, uh, you know, pretty decent pot odds. So even if this play works occasionally, turning my queens into a bluff, it's going to show up a pretty nice profit in the long run. Uh, so he tanks for two and a half minutes or so, and then finally makes the call with the king of diamonds, ten of spades. So the opponent made two pair on the river, and his two-thirds pot size bet was an indicator that he had a pretty strong hand. I don't think I was necessarily trying to bluff him off of that hand, but the fact that he took so long to call lets me know I almost did. So I like my play here. It didn't work, but this is the kind of play that I will make on day one of the main event, knowing that players generally are so afraid to get all their chips in without the nuts that you can kind of push a lot of these guys around because they desperately want to make it to day two for whatever reason. You know there's no extra prize for making it to day two, right? Anyway, a little while later, I played almost the exact same hand. Again, I had pocket queens on an ace high flop. And this time, because of the way things went down, I did not bluff raise the opponent's tiny river bet. I just paid it off instead. And sure enough, he had an ace with a small kicker. So, yeah, I kind of wished I had done it again. There was a different opponent, and it may have worked in that instance where my opponent did not have two pair. But as we know, that is results-oriented thinking, something we try not to practice. All right, so a little while later, uh, a player joins my table. I don't know if he bought in late or if he just showed up from another table, but he's got a uh, an attitude right away. You know, he's got kind of a, a smug look on his face. I immediately didn't like this guy. Uh, he had a ponytail that was braided, which I always think it's a little odd when somebody's trying to be tough, but he also has a ponytail. I don't know. That's just me. It's my personal opinion. I'm allowed to express an opinion on my podcast, but I think if you braid your ponytail, that could make it harder for other people to see you as uh, an actual barbarian. Anyway, this guy thinks he's pretty awesome, and uh, he's he immediately shows up and just you know starts joining the conversation that was already in progress, which, by the way, was about how when dealers have a certain color lanyard around their necks, uh, that means they are day two dealers, which is uh, kind of a badge of honor. It means that you are uh, you know, good enough to deal day twos. They tend to save the better dealers for day twos. Uh, he only heard half this conversation where the dealer was saying there are many dealers who don't have that color lanyard. I think it's yellow, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm colorblind if you didn't know. And anyway, he's saying that some dealers who maybe deserve to have that color lanyard don't because they just haven't gotten an opportunity yet to deal day twos even though they are deserving. So this guy hears half that conversation and starts chiming in about how the dealer just said that yellow doesn't mean anything, which is not what he said at all. And then he kind of turned pink in the face when (laughs) other players started making fun of him for being so obnoxiously cocky and wrong at the very same time. But how often do we see this? You know, 
people show up, they have a lot of attitude, they have a lot of ego, and this was such a player. Now, I'm setting this up because he and I eventually got involved in a few different hands together, and I had position on him, so it was uh, you know, to my advantage to get involved with him, and just knowing that he has this type of ego, I wanted to manipulate that situation as best I could. So it's towards the end of this level. Things have gotten a lot better since this egomaniac showed up. He's been dumping a lot of chips to me. Um, things are going well now. I have 72,000, which is great because I was below starting stack through most of the first four hours of the day. Anyway, uh, he opens to 1,100. And on my right is probably a guy who plays one tournament a year, if that. Uh, businessman, I see him doing like real estate and stuff on his cell phone in between hands. Definitely not a professional player and he's been way too loose. So he calls on the button and I am now in the small blind with the six of spades, four of spades. Now look guys, this is a junk hand and I do not recommend that you play it uh, versus a, a good sized raise from the small blind. So I guess this would be in the category of don't try this at home. I just wanted to get involved with these two players that I felt I had an advantage on. But in retrospect, I think that it's a mistake for me to call with this hand from the small blind. I also think that three betting with this hand as a squeeze play is also not a good idea, especially given the dynamics which have already been set up between this ponytail guy and myself. I should fold, but I don't. I call for 900 more. And the big blind, a mostly loose passive recreational player himself, also calls. So four of us see the flop. And now with 4,700 in the middle, the flop comes king of diamonds, 10 of hearts, five of spades, king, 10, five, rainbow, Hero holding the six of spades, four of spades. So we have three to a straight flush. <laughs> Good flop for us. I decide to check. The big blind checks. And now ponytail bets 2,400 into the 4,700 pot. And the button folds. Now, you got to think about his range before we decide what to do. Yeah, of course, it's nice to have the uh, you know three liner to a <laughs> straight flush. But you know, let's be realistic. I'm unlikely to make that straight flush, but there are a lot of cards that can hit the turn that would allow me to continue if I decide to pull off some kind of play here. And certainly with my opponent being so cocky and his playing style so aggressive, he doesn't need to have a hand as strong as top pair to bet even with three opponents. So combining all that, I decided to pull the trigger on a move here and I check raised after the button folds, I'm, I said 7,500. So remember, he bet 2,400 into 4,700. And now I raised to 7,500, at which time the big blind folded, leaving me heads up with Mr. Ponytail, who calls. So we're loving that. We just want to see a spade come off or some card that helps the cause. And it is the deuce of diamonds. So our board is now king of diamonds, 10 of hearts, five of spades, deuce of diamonds, hero holding the six of spades, four of spades. So we have picked up a gut shot on the turn and I decided to check this card rather than keep firing. I think if my opponent bets small, I can actually put in a small check raise. We have enough chips. I have 72,000, he has me covered. So we're still plenty deep to pull off certain moves depending on bet sizing and stuff. And the double check raise is so strong and so rare. I'm pretty sure it would have worked, but unfortunately my opponent decided to check behind, which is of course fine by me. It gives me a free pull at the gut shot. And guess what the river is? It's a tray, but it's the tray of diamonds, which uh, is a backdoor flush that did come in. So I don't know how worried we need to be about the flush getting there. I decided that the answer is not at all. I feel like had my opponent picked up a flush draw on the turn, he would often have bet it. This guy was not afraid to put chips to work 
and he definitely wanted to assert his dominance over me. So I felt that my straight was pretty much as good as gold and I decided to value bet. Now the pot is 19,700 and I think that a reasonable size for a value bet on this river might be something in the neighborhood of 12K, you know, something the guy can call with like a pair of kings. Uh, I decided to make an unreasonable bet of 26,000 and see if I could get him to look me up with a hand like King Queen. So uh, he tanked for less than a minute and put in a one chip call. I love when they do that. I showed the straight and my opponent started ranting about how bad at poker I am. And yo, you're so bad, bro. You're so bad. What did you check raise with on the flop? And he still hasn't mucked his hand. He eventually turns over pocket jacks. Now I don't know what his purpose in showing the jacks was exactly, but maybe he just wanted me to see that he called my check raise on the flop with a hand worse than top pair. I don't really know what the goal is there. It's just free information for me, which I'll gladly accept. Uh, he did have the jack of diamonds, which may explain why he was less worried that I had a flush because he blocked a flush a little bit. So I don't know, but I was thrilled to uh, win the pot and it was a really nice pot and I was off to the races from there. At one point I had about 150,000 in my stack and uh, you know, life was good at that time. So uh, another hand with, against Ponytail, this one's just kind of a funny story, I guess. This comes from the uh, 200, 400, 400 level, same exact player. He opens to 1400 and the uh, loose real estate guy that I mentioned before calls the 1400. By the way, notice this guy's bet sizing was, was pretty large. I don't know what the theory is there, but I'm starting to see more of that. A few years ago, everyone was min raising everything, and now we're starting to see the three to four X open in certain spots more than we used to. So I'm not sure, maybe it's because everybody's calling everything from out of the big blind. So the game has to continue to ebb and flow, but something to look out for. Let me know if you're seeing that as well. So anyway, he opens and then the real estate guy calls. So I've got ponytail and real estate guy. I'm on the button with like 150,000 in my stack. And I look down at the ace of clubs, jack of clubs. Now you can obviously call behind here. You know, your hand plays well, multi-way, you'll be in position, blah, blah, blah. I decide to go for the squeeze play because I've already established a rivalry with this particular opponent. And I kind of want this real estate guy to be caught in the crossfire between the two of us. So we're looking to sandwich him, forcing him to put way too many chips in with whatever marginal hand he decided to call the first raise with, or to fold getting a decent price to call, close the action and see the flop. Neither one's a very desirable situation for real estate guy. And anytime I can put any of my opponents into undesirable situations, I tend to do so. So let's go. I make it 6,500 and ponytail calls, real estate guy folds. So I was in position with the ace of clubs, jack of clubs, and with 14,000 ish in the middle, the flop came king of clubs, five of clubs, tray of spades. So king five tray with two clubs, hero holding the ace of clubs, jack of clubs for the nut flush draw. In fact, a backdoor royal flush draw. Now there's 14,000 in the middle and my opponent with his braided ponytail staring at me and giving me this evil eye like he wants to eat my children, to borrow a phrase from Mike Tyson circa 1995. I don't know guys, like when somebody's staring at me like that and they look bloodthirsty, I find it amusing. Like, I don't know. It's just odd. It's odd to me when someone stares at you like that. What is he looking for exactly? Like if, if my lip twitches a little bit or my nostrils flare, is he going to change the way he plays whatever he's flopped or missed the flop with? I don't know. It's just odd. Like I understand like you want to look for tells, you want to pay attention to your opponents, their body language, their breathing patterns, things like that, the words they use. Of course, that's all important. It's a huge part of my game, but I don't think I've ever stared at anyone 
with the bloodlust that this player was staring at me with. Anyway, I actually started laughing. Like, I giggled a little bit because it was just so funny. You know, we're not about to step into the MMA ring. We're not about to have a Jets versus Sharks West Side Story dance off. We're just playing cards here, you know? So I giggled a little bit and I bet an annoying amount. I bet 3,200 into the 14,000 pot and my opponent just looked mad and folded. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't know. That's a funny story to me. I don't know. I was having a lot of fun at that table. So yeah, at that point, you know, my stack was up near 160 and life was good. Then uh, we had dinner and after dinner, I came back to earth and things were definitely quite different on the last level of the day. My stack had dwindled basically in half. A lot of things went wrong for us. I remember at one point I had top two pair versus bottom set. That's never fun. So I lost a bunch of chips on that one. I had a few ace king, ace queen type hands where I either raised and then gave up on the flop or tried a little continuation bet and then gave up. And those things add up if a bunch of them happen in a row. I remember one time I raised with pocket eights and the flop came queen jack 10 so that's a check fold right so yeah just a lot of missing a lot of flops and a lot of annoying little pots that i kept losing a bunch of them and you know of course the uh, top two versus a set cost me a lot as well so i'm down to like 82 ish and the blinds are now up to 300 600 with a 600 big blind ante and we are on the last level of the day there's about an hour left to play on day 1A. And I'm under the gun with the eight of hearts, eight of clubs. We've got 82,000 ish in the stack. So we're, I mean, we're doing great. We've got like 140 some big blinds, right? We're, we're doing fine. It's the main event. You never have to feel like you're short stacked on day one, even kind of if you are, because with two hour levels, there's just a lot of room to do a lot of things. So I, I didn't feel like, oh, I've got to get that 150K back. You know, that's a big mistake and something I would have done much earlier in my career. But now I've played the main event so many times. I've learned to just kind of go with the flow. It's all good in the hood, right? So I'm under the gun with pocket eights. I just did a min raise this time. I'd been mixing up my raise sizing, you know, not really based on position or hand strength, just kind of randomizing. So I would open to either 1200, 1300, all the way up to 1600 depending on what's going on at the table and, and how I felt. So I, yeah, I opened under the gun, made it 1200. The cutoff who uh, was a player in a sports hat that I didn't recognize. I, I didn't know what team it was, some kind of sporting team. And I, you know, I pay attention to sports, especially baseball and NFL football, but I didn't recognize this logo at all, but it looked like it was some kind of sports team. So he calls, now he's like in his 50s, mostly tightish, but not super tight. Definitely a recreational player, not someone that had shown any uh, moves or whatever. So yeah, I kind of expected him to be basically an ABC guy. So he calls from the cutoff and then it folds to the big blind who hadn't been at my table all day, but ever since he came, he's been making a lot of noise. An older Asian player, probably in his early 60s, um, had been playing probably 75%-ish of hands. So I really don't mind if he calls because he's so loose. Pocket eights has a huge range advantage and I'll be in position against the loose player. Um, instead, he makes it 5,500 with 80K behind. So I have both of my opponents covered the Asian player only barely, and the player in position has something like 62, 63,000. So I've got him covered by a decent amount. What to do versus this loose, aggressive Asian opponent's uh, three bet from the big blind? Well, even wild, loose, aggressive players typically just take the good price they're being offered from the big blind way too often. The light three bet from the big blind is fairly rare, and I believe he's probably got strength a lot. So even though he's been playing a lot of different hands, I think he could have just called 
for 600 more and seen a flop. Instead, after I raised and someone else called, he decided to say 5,500, which is about nine times the big blind. So I don't really want to get into a raising war with this player. I'd rather just call in position and hopefully flop something with my pocket eights. That's just what I do. I call for 4,300 more, fully expecting my amateur opponent in position in the cutoff to come along for the ride, which he did. So now the three of us are going to play in this three bet pot, hero holding the eight of hearts, eight of clubs, and the flop with 17,500 in the middle, the flop comes eight of spades, five of hearts, four of diamonds, eight, five, four rainbow. So we've got top set, the second nuts on a rainbow board and the big blind leads out for 4,500 into the 17,500 pot. Now I wasn't particularly worried about the big blind having seven, six. I don't think that he's going to be three betting with that hand too often. And I also don't think that the cutoff would have necessarily called my raise with that hand. And I definitely don't think he would have called the big three bet with that hand, even though he was priced in to do so in the latter case. I've been observing this player all day long and I kind of ruled out the nuts. Also, when you have the second nuts and somebody has the nuts, you're kind of supposed to lose a lot of chips, especially when you have redraws, <laughs> which we do even against the nightmare scenario that this player or either of these players happens to have a straight right now on 854. So there's only one straight available and I'm not going to worry about either of my opponents having it. So what should I do when the big blind leads out for 4,500? Well, my thinking is I have a set. It's probably good. And I want to keep the in position player in the pot. So I decided to just flat and I'm hoping that he, he will make a curious call behind with a hand like ace four, maybe king queen suited with backdoor draws. There are a lot of hands that people will over call with in the main event, but not if you raise. You've got to just flat and let them come along. So I got a little greedy. I'm trying to get that 4,500 from both of my opponents, not just one. And to my delight, the in position player, the guy with the hat I don't recognize, raises to 11,000 and the Asian guy folds. So now it's up to me. Do I just want to call for 6,500 more and then ostensibly just check every turn and hope he bets again? I don't know. That doesn't seem good. I think it's time to keep raising. You know, he says he has something. What if he's got a hand like 5-4 or maybe he slow played pocket aces and will never fold them under any circumstances? You see these kinds of things in this particular tournament. Maybe he's got a set himself. What if he's sitting there with pocket fives? Wouldn't that be amazing? So I don't think that just smooth calling this raise, especially when he raised two opponents. Remember the big blind bet I called and now this guy says, no, 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 let's do 11,000. It's a great sign of strength. So I'm hoping for the best case scenario, which is he's got a set. Some of the biggest pots in No Limit Hold'em are set versus set situations. And I know that nobody has a better set than I do right now with my three of a kind eights. So I decide to just go all in. You know, it looks crazy. Maybe I've got some kind of draw, something like eight, seven or six, five. Bottom line, I know this type of player is not going to sit there and think, is my set no good? I don't even think that if he somehow had five, four, which I don't think is in his range, but if he somehow had that hand, I also think that he would definitely consider it good enough to get all in with. So I was very happy to get all my chips in. Uh, he snap called with pocket fours. And this is about as good as it gets. I'm like 93 and a half percent, something like that on this flop. Uh, he's got one out twice. So whatever that is. And uh, well, the, the turn was a four. <laughs> so <laughs> he had pocket fours and uh, then he made four of a kind. And he yelled, boom, about as loudly as a human being can yell it. It shook 
the table. He yelled it so loudly. A lot of us jumped. Um, I was already sick from seeing the four. Uh, then I also have to hear him yell, boom. And my heart just sunk because I knew that with one card to come, I was now the player with one out and it didn't get there. Um, you know, I shared this hand on Twitter, not really expecting anyone to argue with um, my playing strategy here. I mean, I got this guy to put in over 100 big blinds when he had one out. I think that's usually a good thing to do, right? <laughs> but many on Twitter, to my surprise, were saying that they would never go all in with any hand on day one of the main event unless they had the nuts on the river. So it's hard to have the nuts on the river. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's a little too tight. What is the value of making day two? I will never understand this mentality. You guys know my record in the World Series of Poker main event. I've now played it 11 times and I only have two caches. I think three times I haven't made day two in those 11 attempts. I am not a uh, sit around and try to get to day two kind of player. I am a let's maximize our big hands and try to get people to put in lots of chips, drawing almost completely dead kind of player. So uh, I was surprised at the backlash um, on Twitter over this hand, but you got to remember these armchair quarterbacks, they claim to know what they're doing, but I think most of them don't pony up the $10,000 buy-in every summer like I do. That one hurt. I still had some chips after that. I was very much alive. I had top pair with ace jack, flopped a jack, it was no good. That cost me about half the remaining stack and then I only had like 7,000 left, which is still more than 10 big blinds at the end of the day, um, you know, day one. So I had like 11 and a half big blinds and pocket fives in the cutoff. So I, you know, I shoved like every book in the world would say to do. And I got called by the small blind with jacks and that was all she wrote for me. So that's how I busted out of the biggest main event in World Series of Poker history with one hour left to play in day one. And that'll do it for this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed these hands. And I want to hear what you guys have to say. Get on Twitter at Clayton Comic. Click the link in the description of this podcast to join our Discord and let me know what you think of the strategies I employed in these hands and let me know for sure what you think you'll be doing come December. And for everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge and with special thanks as always to our generous sponsor, ACR, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. Hold them like they do in Texas plays. Fold them, let them hit me, raise it, baby, stay with me. Lock in intuition, play the cards with babes to start. And after she's been hooked, I'll play the one that's on her heart.
to love nobody. Yeah.